This program has been made possible by a grant from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. The UCF Office of Research and Commercialization is committed to moving the discoveries of our faculty and students from ideas to innovation to realization. By moving research from the laboratory to the private sector, we are helping to diversify Florida's economy and helping to bring high paying jobs to our state. This program presents some examples of our research and our efforts to transition this research to the private sector. Welcome to Zenith. I'm your host, Ed Hyland, and today we are in Central Florida Research Park. This campus, this office park, covers over 1,000 acres next to the University of Central Florida and is home to over 116 companies. Many of those firms thrive here because of technology transfer, the creating and distribution of ideas and invention. In today's program, we'll learn more about tech transfer with a leader in the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. We'll also hear about the power of patents and why a patent scorecard can play an important role in bringing in new research money. Stay with us for Zenith. University of Central Florida Technology Incubator, cultivating success through creative ideas, performance, and partnerships. Because there's a lot of people doing a lot of work every day, and that's what everybody brings together. So they, it wouldn't be successful without the partnerships. The UCF Technology Incubator is a university-driven community partnership providing early stage technology companies with the enabling tools, training, and infrastructure to create financially stable, high growth enterprises. With locations in the Central Florida Research Park adjacent to the UCF campus in East Orlando and in downtown Orlando, the UCF TI is home to over 50 new and innovative high-tech companies. That's up from 12 companies when the incubator opened its doors in 1999. The incubator has created hundreds of high-paying jobs in Central Florida with an average annual salary of $59,000. <laughs> Our clients include Mydea Technologies Corporation provides advanced product development services that help companies get to market faster and more efficiently by utilizing rapid production processes. These technologies take companies' designs to physical parts in under a week and sometimes less than a day. The incubator provides you with a ton of experience, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years experience from different individuals. The UCF Technology Incubator, promoting optimal corporate growth and making a significant contribution to the economic development of the region's high technology sector. Welcome back. There are powerful tools which are helping to refine technology, create new materials for research, and allow us to see objects right down to the molecular level. One such tool is the scanning electron microscope. And just a few feet from where I'm standing, one of the best models in the industry is in operation. Uh, scanning electron microscope is really the uh, foundation of uh, modern characterization of the materials. Not only uh, you can image things like you would see with a, 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 you know, an optical microscope, which most of us are familiar with, uh, the SEM utilizes the electron beam to, to image uh, the materials. But SEM is much more than that. Um, not only you get the image, but you can get a lot of different type of information, including chemistry, uh, including um, uh, orientation of uh, materials, uh, so on and so forth. And this particular machine is sort of the uh, state-of-the-art uh, with uh, 
as you would say, all the bells and whistles so that you can maximize the, the analysis and characterization of your materials. This basically is what I would say is a very generic instrument uh, that uh, can do all the SM can do. And a lot of the industry, a lot of the university faculty, a lot of the national labs or government agencies are looking for these type of facilities. And the one that we have here is basically represents the state of the art uh, with uh, the type of analysis that uh, we can do here basically represents all possible uh, analysis that can be done attached to the SEM. We are really pushing towards uh, making things or, or getting things or analyzing things at really um, at atomic, uh, s several atomic or, or say molecular type of level and uh, even trying to uh, make something at this level essentially that's functional uh, for uh, certain applications. What this machine can do is to uh, work at that level while you're seeing it as if you know with your own eyes essentially through the electron microscope so um, the, the fact that ability to see things and analyze things not just see things but analyze things and uh, even make things at this particular level uh, opens up really uh, you know what people have uh, referred to as sort of the nanoscience and technology uh, at, the, at making things or manipulating things at smaller scale uh, it really rep uh, opens up the whole uh, new door uh, because you're watching it as this happens. Scanning electron microscopy is being done at the Advanced Materials Processing and Analysis Center, AMPAC, which is also home to the $10 million Materials Characterization Facility. Well, still ahead, the top tech and power patents. The mission of the Office of Technology Transfer at the University of Central Florida is to proactively facilitate the transfer of technology from the university to the commercial sector through enlightened technology transfer policies, processes that efficiently and effectively reduce off-the-shelf technology inventory, and dedication to customers and being easy to do business with. Our guiding principles are development of intellectual property assets, licensing them into the commercial sector, which leads to a return on investment for the university. We envision an eventual contribution to the economic development within the Central Florida region, the state, and the nation. UCF will be recognized as a contributor and leader in the future economic performance of the Central Florida region. The Office of Research and Commercialization at UCF has experienced some monumental changes in its short history. Sponsored research funding for last year was 10 times the amount just two decades before. Tom O'Neill is the Associate VP for the department, and I had a chance to sit down with him in our Zenith studios to catch up on areas of focus for tech. Tom, let's talk a little bit about uh, hot technologies. You know, part of the boom really has, has been uh, uh, very apparent here at the University of Central Florida. And, and what I wanted to kind of kick off with is clean tech. What, what exactly does that mean? Well, it's, it's a broad area is, is the problem. It's hard to define um, specifically, but it's anything that really kind of leaves a zero negative impact on society, you know. So it's either self um, uh, kind of actuated, if you know what I mean, like solar energy, you know, it, it's just self-generating, self-processed. Uh, it's clean in the sense it's not dirty, one way to look at it, right? Um, 
not leaving a big negative carbon impact on the world, uh, regenerative stuff, we're not depleting resources. Um, things of, of that nature are clean tech, you know. So again, it could be taking algae and making fossil fuels out of it, or making fuels out of it. Um, again, it's all these great solar energy stuff they're doing now. Better photovoltaics, you know, to bring energy into the grid uh, is, is a way of looking at it. And then the way to leave the planet in good shape, I guess. So you think of all the things that make that happen, it's, it's just a broad area. And it's funny in a way too because uh, something like solar energy, for example, is something that we in Florida have talked about for many, many years, mm -hmm. but it just seems like recently, just in the last couple of years, it started to take off. The power companies have started to embrace it. They're actually talking about giving people, mm -hmm. you know, some, some money to, to generate your own power and give something back to the, the general grid. And, and organizations like the Florida Solar Energy Center are, are playing a role in that as well. When, when gas gets four dollars a gallon, a lot of this stuff seems much more attractive. You know, it's been a price problem for, for a long time. Solar energy, you know, the the price per kilowatt is still high. You know, and as long as uh, the other ways of producing energy is much more cost effective, it's going to be a hard time, hard road to get people to adopt that stuff. And are, are we playing here at UCF a, a, a role in trying to to facilitate some of that through the Florida Solar Energy Center, also through some of the unique uh, patents that we have? Yes, we are certainly trying to do that. Um, that's been the solar energy mission for like 30 years, you know, so they're, they are way ahead of the time when it comes to kind of get into the space. Um, but, you know, um, the technology is starting to make some pretty good breakthroughs in terms of, of, of cost of these things. Um, we have a company called Petrosolar, I think you, you might have mentioned before in your show, that they're making solar panels with the whole idea of making them plug and play, you know, technology we hadn't thought about before because to put a solar panel array on a, on a roof now, you have to hire a professional electrician, Costs lots of money to do these uh, circuitries and these power converters on top of your roof. We're really trying to build all that into the solar panel and making it built in a very cost-effective way. With, a, with the ultimate goal, of someone can go down to Walmart and buy one of these solar panels and just plug it into the grid up on the roof. And every time they have a little extra money, they go add another one to it and you just plug them in. No, um, no. Uh, Degreed engineering uh, required, if you know what I mean. And you hit on a key point too in that so much, whether it's it's solar energy or some of the other uh, areas of research that are happening here at at UCF, uh, it's all starting to filter down, if you will. It used to have a certain level of military or industrial, and and a lot of the the research effort is is helping to make that something that's more user friendly, something you and I can use at home, for example. And even the military won't say blue. Now they don't want to pay. Um, prototype prices for stuff. They want it to become commercial prices. You know, they want to reduce their cost structure too. So, uh, even if we're doing things that maybe the government may be the biggest customer, they want to be a customer, not a sole source provider of stuff. So, uh, the whole idea of getting things out in the commercial kind of realm or in the marketplace is what everybody realizes it needs to be done. It helps our economy. It helps. It helps the government buy things at prices they can afford, and it's just better for everybody. Let's talk about life sciences as well. Uh, obviously, something that people have an interest in. But have we had some breakthroughs in this area as well? We're st we're ramping up. You know, uh, we we have some very good initial success. I think as uh, we build our medical city and we can finish hiring our faculty in the med school and the the Burnett um, School of Biomedical Sciences, you'll see even more stuff. You know, uh, uh, chemistry guys, stem cell work, Henry Daniels work in chloroplast transformation technology, all is very good promise. You know, I think. Um, we're on the for forefront of kind of setting ourselves up to be uh, uh, kind of a major player in the thrust areas that we're good at. UCF has never tried to be good at everything, but I think we're coming out with our niches that we'll be good at in the life science area as well. How big a role did the uh, the unraveling, so to speak, of the human genome uh, really play in, in making some of this more available to us? Well, I think it's, uh, I mean, it opens up whole new ways of thinking about uh, medicine. You know, you start thinking about personalized medicine and understanding um, uh, treatment plans for people from the time they're born, you know, with di certain dispositions, you know, treating illnesses before they occur, you know, and and uh, you look at someone's DNA and they're if they're 90 percent sure they're going to get cancer, well, you go ahead and start treating it early in life, you know, and uh, and it's a whole new way of of, of dealing with this uh, this whole life science rather than just treating the symptoms, uh, getting rid of the cause from the beginning. So. Life sciences uh, is often tied into to nanotechnology. Getting we talk about genome, trying to get down to the, the nano level, but nano itself is a, is a pretty broad area as well. Uh, can we can we get into that one a little bit here too? Yeah. Uh, well, certainly nano is, is ten to the minus nine. That's what I tell people. It's kind of a, a science, but the whole um, concept, if you will, is just look at, look at things at the very small scale. And just, of course, life science people have been looking at molecules and cells for a long time, so they've been looking at at things at that uh, scale forever. They, they've 
they could say they've been the first nano people if they wanted to, right? But the whole idea of the way things interact with each other at, at that kind of molecular level is different than, than the way things interact in bulk. So if you can understand how to put things together at the nanoscience scale, I mean, putting individual cells together rather than massive quantities of it, it think it's a different science. So I mean, it's going to help um, uh, just the whole discipline, if you will, of nanoscience as well as the life science. A lot of nanoscience is um, life science related, so the work they do. A lot of stuff here we uh, we do as well is uh, there's a large component in our nanoscience technology field that's doing life science work. And, and one of the things we saw earlier in, in, in this scene of the program talked about uh, the, the electron microscope and, and really looking at metals, solid objects at, at the nano level and then figuring out ways to perhaps, it seems odd to me that we're, we're improving metal, we're making it better by able, being able to see how it's made up. Yeah, I mean, that's it. You, know, you can see the deformities, you can see how to make it strength. You can, get, you can get them to bond together in ways that they don't naturally do, you know. At the bulk scale, you can make much stronger, much lighter materials. You know, uh, these carbon nanotubes and stuff are just amazing properties for them. You're going to make something that's much stronger than anything we have that weighs much less than anything we have now. So, um, lots of properties we can we can manipulate at that scale. One of the things that that really you know makes the world turn these days is is the whole idea of, of creating things, or at least coming up with the ideas for things, and then that leads into patents, hopefully, and then hopefully those patents will build into to bigger and better things. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the the patent scorecard, if you will, and, uh, and the IEEE scorecard that is very important in, in rankings for universities. How does UCF stand uh, right now, and uh, how are we uh, uh, looking to to improve on the patent process? Well, the, the the patent scorecard that the IEEE just did was um, really based on the number of times our patents are cited by other patents, you know, and then they, they do some massaging the data so it's not just how many times you quoted your own patent, you know, it's by other people. So it's a good measure. We're in the top ten. I think we're ranked number seventh, you know, with some very good company. And without a lot of patents, which is the, kind of the, the more interesting thing, you know, we're, it shows us that our patents, while not large in numbers, are very uh, good in quality, so it's, a, it's more of a measure of the quality of the, the research that we do in terms of them being enabling technologies for other people to build on. So uh, they take our base stuff and they build it and build it and these are all the enabling kind of disruptive technologies as a platform, you know, going forward, which makes it real important, much more important than just the one-off stuff that no one, no one does, you know, so. So these are the seeds, if you will, for, for, for future inventions. Can, can you give us some idea of the process in, in the sense that, uh, I mean, everybody wants to go out and find, you know, the next great thing. Yeah. But um, uh, as you say, sometimes we start in one area and then maybe we have to go to a different area and we get the whole collaboration thing going. So that can lead to something that's new and then that can lead to a patent. Yeah, a patent is um, certainly has to be novel. That's one of the, the, the main thresholds it has to pass. It can't be obvious or can't have been done before, you know. So you're looking for new things, you know, certainly you want to patent it. And the reason you patent it, other than, you know, having a piece of paper you can hang on your wall, if you will, is because it gives someone the right to practice that uh, solely, if you will, exclusively for some number of years. So all the research and that work you've done to do that, there's a reward structure built that will help you take advantage of it. Or someone else, you know, um, you think about the commercial stuff, I mean, it does no value for a company if they can do something and everybody else can do it, you know. So in, in the old days, before the, the Bayh-Dole Act was passed, um, government research, for example, if you did it, if the government paid for university research, it belonged to everybody. So nobody was interested in it, you know. Uh, now that, that universities are allowed to patent their stuff and keep it in their names, they can license it to companies. These companies get a competitive advantage. They can use that advantage to go out and raise funding and, and hire interesting people to work for them and then go ahead and sell their products to companies. And they have about 20 years, more or less, that they're the only player in, in that space. And then they get to compete on price after that and other, inter other traditional competitive advantages will. But hopefully they can make them successful. And the money that is generated by those can then be reinvested into uh, the system to uh, to help generate further patents and do additional research? At the university level, yes. I mean, the, the royalties we earned or the, or the equity positions we take in these companies can, can come back to the university to support more research, um, um, basically. And, you know, some there's a percentage that goes back to the faculty. So, you know, there's a certain financial incentive for the people, the inventors. Incentives are always yeah, good. Right. Tom O'Neill, thank you so much for joining us. We'd like to have you come back and join us. It seems like there's much more that we need to talk about. So uh, come back and see us again here on Xena. Be happy to. All right. And you stay with us. We have just enough time left for our Research Minute. What we do in exposure is have people confront their fears. What's your anxiety level now? With virtual reality therapy, we can have people confront their fears 
in a manner that we can easily control, um, also have them confront them in a way that's better than just thinking about them because we use both audio, video, and in some cases we can even use olfactory stimulation in order to really simulate the environment and what it is they're afraid of. We take them through each step and only when they become comfortable with that particular step do we then move on to the next step. These are treatments that are not very long in length. About um, 12 to 15 sessions is usually all that's required. The sessions usually run between 60 and 90 minutes depending on the person's level of anxiety. So it's a very, it's not only a very effective treatment, it's also a short-term treatment in addition to the virtual reality is we would give her assignments to practice in real life. And our time has run out for this edition of Zenith. But there is much more ahead, including future programs on the latest in technology transfer, and more with Tom O'Neill of the Office of Research and Commercialization. The goal of research is to better understand the world around us. Our goal is to be a window to that world. I'm Ed Hyland. Thanks for joining us.